Okay, now that we've explained some of the basics of elements, we know that uh, discrete energy levels exist, we're getting really close to understanding bonding, but we still haven't yet described why bonds form. So, uh, what are bonds? Why do they form? Let's talk about why they form first, right? So, before we do that, we need to introduce this idea of an oxidation state. What in the world is an oxidation state? So, different elements, we showed it up here with our, um, with this table here. We said that things could become ionized. We could strip away electrons. We can also add electrons. We can force something to pick up electrons. For example, fluorine is add, if you added one more electron, fluorine looks like neon. You think it's going to like that? Yeah, it definitely is. So even though you're giving it an extra negative charge, it's going to take a little bit of energy. It's not going to take very much. Oxygen also, give it two electrons and it looks like neon. So they can add electrons or over here like magnesium could remove two electrons to look like neon. In all those scenarios, um, there's going to be some energy uh, penalties and costs, right? But if you're, if you're only just removing one and you look like a noble gas, then we know it's not going to cost a lot of energy. And if you're fluorine, you're picking up one electron, that's not going to cost a lot either, okay? So uh, those are oxidation states. If you can pick up or lose an electron, you become oxidized or reduced, right? So things that is your oxidation or reduction, okay? Let's do some examples, right? Um, so for example, aluminum, aluminum as a metal, if it loses three electrons, then it becomes aluminum three plus, right? Because it lost three electrons, so it must make up for that by being positively charged. And we know that because of where aluminum is on the periodic table, aluminum is right here on the periodic table, right? So if it loses one, two, three, then it's going to look like a noble gas. And so it could also choose to lose one, but then it's not going to look like a noble gas. It could choose to lose one, two, but then it's not going to look like one. So what do you think the oxidation state that's most likely is for aluminum? It's going to be three plus, right? In fact, of the known charges, it only exists in a three plus state. Well, what about calcium? What do you think it would be? Again, if it loses one, then it looks like potassium. That's not really great. If it loses one, two, then it looks like a noble gas. So sure enough, if you click calcium, plus two is the only state that it's observed in in nature. Boron is going to be plus three. Carbon, take a look at this, its most common state is actually plus four. It loses one, two, three, four electrons, and then it looks like helium, right? It looks like a noble gas. So all of a sudden, we have a tool that makes it really easy to predict what's the most common number of electrons that something's going to lose, right? Um, and there's exceptions, right? Take a look at titanium here. Titanium can lose a bunch of different things. It can, be, it can lose two electrons, become two plus. It can lose three, or it can lose four. Well, the four is the most easy to understand because we lose one, two, three, four, and it looks like, um, titanium then looks like argon, uh, a noble gas. That makes sense, okay? Why is two and three okay? Well, remember, these are all different orbitals. This is your one, this is your S orbitals, these are your D orbitals, and these are your P orbitals over here. So if it loses, two electrons, it could empty out its D shell. And what do we know about shells? Let's write this down over here. Um, the rules that we have for shells, for electrons, for them to be happy, they either want to be totally filled, totally filled, totally empty, or they like to be half filled. So this is like really happy, really happy, and this is like eh, kind of happy. Okay. So, and when I say happy, what am I talking about? I'm talking about ionization energies, right? You can see that, like, um, let's look over here, right? In this half state, when you have half of your d electrons, it's lower energy. As soon as you go from a half state to half plus one, six of the 10 sites occupied, you jumped up in energy. You, and you can see it right there in the ionization energy. So getting rid of that one goes to a lower energy state. That's why we say that things like to be filled or empty, right? So totally empty, it's okay with. Totally filled, it's okay with. And half, it kind of likes. Anything in between costs a little bit more energy. Okay, so our shells like to be filled, empty, or half filled. That helps us understand what oxidation state things are going to have. Um, so two makes sense because you empty the d orbital, 
right? Now, why would 3 plus be acceptable for titanium? Well, if it loses 3, it loses 1, 2, 3. What does that do to the S shell? It makes it actually half-filled, which is kind of acceptable. Um, let's look at chromium. What do you think chromium states will be? Well, looking at it, we could count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it probably has a plus 6. What else do you think it has? Well, it could lose just those two and be plus 2, plus 6. It could probably um, do uh, 3 as well, where it would get rid of, let's see, 4. It could get rid of these 4 and maybe even 5. Let's see which ones are actually available to it. Yeah, sure enough. 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Chromium has lots of ways to reach that filled, half-filled, or um, empty uh, arrangement. Okay. Then you get in the middle and it gets a little bit funky. So like iron, iron could lose two. It could lose these two electrons. Now why would it choose to lose these instead of these ones first? To answer that, we have to go back to our drawing of the discrete energy levels. And for each atom, it's a little bit different, but they generally look something like this. Take a look right here. Our we're talking about which energy levels. So the first two are 1s, then you've got 2s. These ones right here are 2p. Then you've got 3s. Then you've got your 3p. This is 4s, but these ones right here are 3d. So 3d follow 4s. So can we see that? Yeah, 4s. So again, going up in energy, it's 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p. 4s fills before 3d because it's lower in energy. But they're, they're starting to get really close to each other. 4p is really close. All these start to, those lines start to bunch together, and we can see that in the spectral line. See how they start to bunch together? So the energy differences start to get really small between them. So it's possible for you to actually take out the 4s electrons, lose two of those before you take any of these out. Why would iron like to do that? Well, let's, let's count for a minute. Iron could, to get to 2 plus, if it lost one here, then it's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 electrons left. 5 means a half-filled orbital for the Ds, right? Because there's 10 seats available. So if you have 5 of them filled, it's half-filled. If you So that's by losing 1. If you lose another one, then you half-fill both of those, and that's that's happy, right? It could be 3 plus, and it would lose that one, and now it's half-filled in the D orbital, and then both of those, and it's happy. Now, 4 plus, I don't know what arrangement gets you to 4 plus and 6 plus and that, but the point is that there's different oxidation states available based off of them trying to reach more stable configurations, which, again... The very simple rule that we're going to use in this class is half-filled, filled, and uh, and empty. Okay, So you could go through and you could figure out what all these things are. Yttrium, pretty much only going to be plus 3. Zirconium, almost always plus 4. Right? Tantalum, almost always plus 5. That's the most common by, sh by far, but you can also get 3s and 4s. Okay? That, those are our oxidation states. So now that we realize that different elements take different oxidation states, and that if you have a handy uh, periodic table handy, you can guess what the oxidation state is, all of a sudden you can start guessing what type of compounds will form. Now why do compounds form? Why does rust form, right? Iron can form oxides, it can form woostite, that's FeO, it can form Fe2O3, that's hematite, or it can form magnetite, uh, Fe3O4. So why are all these different oxides possible for iron? Well, because iron can have different oxidation states. We just showed you, right? Iron right here can be 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, or whatever, right? So one of its most common states is 2, so that will form FeO. Why is the formula FeO and not Fe2O3 for 2 plus? Well, look at where oxygen is. Oxygen's over here. How many electrons does it have to gain to look like neon? It has to gain 1, 2. So sure enough, by far the most common oxidation state for oxygen is 2 minus. Okay? So if iron is 2 plus and it bonds with a 2 minus oxygen, 1 and 1 will cancel out. So the, the formula is going to be FeO. Now let's imagine Fe3+. Plus. We said that another oxidation state for iron is in the 3 plus state. Okay, so if it's now 3 plus, how many oxygens would it have to bond with? Well, one iron is 3 plus, one oxygen is 2 minus. You put those together and you have excess positive charge. So you have to come up with a, a lowest common denominator and they end up with Fe2O3. Remember, each iron is plus 3, each oxygen is minus 2. So 3 times negative 2, that equals 6. And positive 3 times 2, that equals 6. You've got positive 6 and you've got negative 6. And so there you got it. It's perfect. Uh, so the, comp the, electrical, or the uh, chemical formula for Fe, uh, in, when it's Fe3 plus oxidation state, is Fe2O3. How cool is that? Same thing with alumina, by the way. We know that alumina, when it forms an oxide, is Al2 
O3 for the exact same reason. Each aluminum is plus 3, because that's its only oxidation state that it likes. Oxygen is almost always 2 minus, so the only way to make that thing work is by doing F Al2O3, and, that, and then your charges balance. Charges have to balance. It's a very strong force in the universe is having charge neutrality. So in these compounds, they have to balance. Oops, Al. Okay. Next up, uh, what about what about sometimes ox or iron can exist with both states? It can be present with both charges, two plus and three plus. So in this compound, Fe3O4, two of your irons are three plus, and one of them is two plus. So let's write it out like this: We have Fe. We said two of them are three plus. Fe3 plus, Fe3 plus. Then you've got Fe2 plus. One of them is two plus. How many oxygens do you need? Well, let's add them up. You've got 3 plus 3 plus 2, so that's 8. It ends up with a total positive charge of 8. So if you have oxygens that come in 2 minus varieties, how many do you need? You need 4 of them, right? You're going to need 4 to get to negative 8 if you have 4 of those, right? So then positive 8 equals to negative 8. That's happy. There's 3 oxygens and 4, sorry, 3 irons and 4 oxygens. Therefore, the formula is Fe3O4. And that's the uh, magnetite. Uh, rust is Fe2O3. Fe3O4 is magnetite. It's a different type of iron oxide. This makes sense? So um, if any of this is unclear, you want to see more examples, of course, I will have um, office hours on Discord where I can do, I can write up more examples. You'll all be able to sh screen share. You can ask any questions you'd like, but this is the idea behind bonding. Doesn't that make much more sense? Once you understand this basic, basic rules about electron orbitals being filled, half filled, or uh, empty, all of a sudden, you can guess pretty obviously what things are going to be. So zinc, because it has a filled orbital here, it's not going to want to lose any of its d electrons, but it will part with two of these s electrons. So again, the most common charge for zinc is going to be 2 plus. So if zinc forms an oxide, what will be the, the formula? It's going to be zinc 2 plus and oxygen 2 minus, which is going to be ZnO. It's going to be a one-to-one -one compound because they have the same charge, just op they have the same magnitude of charge, just opposite. Okay. Um, electronegativity is how bad something wants an electron, right? So how badly does potassium want an electron? Not very much, because if it gets rid of an electron, it looks like argon, which it wants to. Meanwhile, fluorine, if it gets one electron, it looks like neon and it's happy. So electronegativity typically increases as you go across the periodic table and as you go from bottom to top. Why does it increase as you go from bottom to top? It's something called screening. Basically, if you're clear down here at francium, remember, Francium is in the 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s, right? So there's seven of these nested spheres of s orbitals. And so because there's so many of these nested, like Russian nesting dolls, spheres below it, this outer one is really, it's screened from the positive charge in the center because there's lots of electrons between it, right? So um, that, that's why the, this, this phenomenon goes from low, it's from the bottom left-hand corner of the periodic table to the top right-hand electronegativity increases. So... It increases like this. Okay. Um, all right, finally, we can talk about then why do bonds form? So let's talk about why does O2 as a gas form, right? You've probably seen this before in chemistry that oxygen is O2. So that means that it's bonded together. Two oxygens get together and they're happier together. Why? Like, why is that a thing? Well, let's go to our periodic table. Where's oxygen? Oxygen is element number eight, right? That's its atomic number, is number 8. So that means it has 8 electrons. So let's draw it. I'm going to draw it in terms of energy. So this is energy going up over here. On the vertical axis, we've got energy. So down here, we're going to draw an orbital. This is the 1s orbital. Okay. And again, if you don't remember your s, p, d orbitals, you can go back and review that in Gen Chem. I'm not going to do it in this class for the sake of time. But 1s is down here. Then you've got your 2s orbitals. You've got three 2p orbitals. So you've got your 2s, you've got your 2p, okay? So that's one oxygen. Let's start putting in our electrons. So it has eight of them, so it's going to go one, two. Remember, we can put two electrons per orbital, one up and one down, but we can't do more than that. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember, electrons are just like people on a bus. People on a bus, if you get on a bus, you ever notice this, that people don't like pair up automatically? They spread out, right? Everyone sits one person per seat, and then when we have to, we look around, we're like, well, dang, all the seats are empty. That's when we start pairing up. So we're at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but we need to get to eight. So that eighth one is going to go spin down. Make sense? 
That's oxygen. Okay, so there's another oxygen over here. I'm going to move this out of the way. Okay, there's another oxygen over here that looks the exact same. So these would be oxygens that are unbonded. They're not bonded to one another. They're alone in the universe, just a single oxygen atom. They look the same. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They each have eight electrons. Now, why would these things get a better gig by coming together? Why would they be happier to do that? Well, because you get bonds forming in bonding and antibonding orbitals, right? So these two orbitals, I'm going to switch our color here. these two 1s orbitals that they each contribute, the average position is the same as where they were before, but some go a little bit lower and some go a little bit higher. That's your bonding and antibonding orbitals. So 1s and 2s both do this. And so by putting your electrons in these orbitals, you benefit on one hand because it goes down a little bit, like these two right here. That one and that one both go down a little bit but the other ones go up by just as much so there's no real benefit there but there is a benefit up here in this orbital it looks like this you've got one two three four five six so there's the six orbitals from before they each contributed three but you go down and you go up but look because we only have one two three four eight electrons to fill in here let's start filling them one two three four five six seven eight Take a look at that. How cool is that? All of a sudden, it's overall because these, this was our where it started before, it actually, we feel more of electrons in a slightly lower energy level than before. And so it's actually stable. It went down in energy a little bit by these two oxygen atoms coming together and forming an O2 molecule. Isn't that cool? So all the bonding in the world, like the chemical formulas, why these things come together can be explained once we understand these different energy levels and how and how these atoms want to share or not share the, electric, the electrons that they have, okay? So that is why bonds form. That's why oxygen is a, um, is a diatomic molecule and not a single gas uh, uh, atom floating around. It's a molecule instead of an atom. Um, meanwhile, if you looked at our periodic table for something like argon, right, argon over here, that wouldn't be the case because argon, check it out, if we did argon, it would just be these totally filled. So if these were totally filled, then when you filled them, you'd have to totally fill all of these. And we said that these are symmetrical. There are just as many below as there are above. So there's no benefit. There's no benefit for them to fill them totally above by bonding because it's still just the same as them being equal. And that's why these um, noble gases don't typically bond. Okay? They don't form bonds. I mean, there's some exceptions, but for the most part, they don't. That's why bonds form.